Bibles. We think the Bible is one grand unified story, and so we're making videos about each individual book of the Bible, showing you how it's designed and how we'll stop it's stop at the next grand. The Gospel of Mark is a book in the Bible. <laughs> just in case we didn't get it the first time, that's what that is. It's good. <laughs> Interesting. Mark, when he writes about John Mark, he writes about Jesus. He's not saying Jesus with this royal lineage. He's not saying Jesus uh, as something grand. The way he presents Jesus is yes, Jesus is God, but he's God the servant. And so if you want to present Jesus as God the servant, you don't have genealogies. You don't have all that stuff that the other Gospels have. You just go straight to the story about how he lives and, and what he does. So I'm not surprised he begins Mark's Gospel with these words. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It began just as God said in the book written by Isaiah the prophet. I'm sending my messenger to go the, very, uh, go the way, to get the way ready for you. In the desert, someone is shouting, get the road ready for the Lord. Make a straight path for him. Hey, he's not saying, as people do today, you know, just let me write your story and account, and here's one option to get right with God. Here's something um, we should talk about. He's saying, no, this, this is the good news. Man, this is it. This is the plain and simple way to get right with God personally. It's through Jesus. And he quotes Isaiah to explain that, to explain his role in it. Verse 4, so John the Baptist showed up in the desert and told everyone, turn back to God. That's the old-fashioned word repent. It means specifically turn away from specific sin. It's change of mindset. It's got nothing to do with a quick 10-second prayer. It's a heart-rendering, tear-dropping, I've been sinning in this area. I remember when I first became a Christian, as God convicted me, I was standing in a paddock surrounded by Frisian cows. And as God started talking to me, he said, Russell, you've treated your parents terribly. You've dishonored your parents. You've been rude. You've been a pest to them, you know. You've sinned against me and against your parents. And you ring them up tonight and apologize and you ask my forgiveness. And you honor your mum and dad from now on. That was the first thing he said to me when you started convicting me of my sin. That's what repentance is. It's not some 10 second prayer. It's like, I'm going to change your heart. I'm having to change your mind with the help of God. I'm going that way. I'm changing direction. Turn back to God, the modern translations put it, and be baptized. Then your sins will be forgiven. From all Judea and Jerusalem, crowds of people went to John. They told how sorry they were for their sins, and he baptized them in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel hair. He had a leather strap around his waist, and he ate grasshoppers and wild honey. John also told the people, someone more powerful is going to come, and I'm not good enough even to stoop down and untie his sandals. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was not a baptism of salvation like it's linked to in the New Testament. It's a baptism of repentance. So he's calling out to a nation that's doing their own thing, that's following rules and regulations. Their hearts aren't right. They're doing things wrong and saying, boy, if, if you want to get right with God, you come out here and you tell me your sins and I'll baptise you and those sins will be forgiven. Very different from the baptism that takes place after the death of Christ and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He's preaching, repent, be baptised so that your sins will be forgiven and suddenly his cousin Jesus shows up. Now John knows Jesus really, really well, as you'd expect. And other translations, other gospels say, um, when John saw Jesus coming to him to be baptised, he just freaked out. He said, oh, 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 no, no, no. I ought to be baptised by you. I'm not doing this. And then Jesus insists. And we read. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. And John baptised him in the Jordan River. As soon as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the sky open and the Holy Spirit coming down on him like a dove. A voice from heaven said, You are my own dear son, and I'm pleased with you. Right away, God's Spirit made Jesus go into the desert. He stayed there for 40 days while Satan tested him. Jesus was with wild animals, but the angels took care of him. A couple of things, friends. I'm not surprised that a battle ensued straight away after his baptism. It normally happens. In fact, I find if people say to me, Russell, I'm going to wait a month to get baptised when Uncle Toby's here from Te uh, they have a real battle for that month. 
And I usually find that when people get baptised, there's a, a window two or three months after their baptism where Satan tries to push every single button to get them to turn back again. They're fully in God's family. They belong to God. They're clothed in righteousness. And Satan says, darn it. They've just begun living a life of faith. If I'm going to get them back, I'm going to need to do it now before they mature and get strong. And a real battle ensues. And if that brand new Christian isn't in fellowship, if that brand new Christian isn't being shaped by the word and shaped by the spirit, they're in trouble. They're vulnerable. They need to be connected with folk. I'm not surprised straight after Jesus' baptism, he's sent to the wilderness and Satan releases all his big guns on him. One thing I want to point out about baptism before we go through some texts is this, that Jesus as a baby was dedicated in the temple and the great prophetess and the great prophet prayed over him and blessed him. I believe prayers prayed over babies are powerful, powerful and effective things. And later on when he was about 13 years of age he had a bar mitzvah, something I've never seen. But I understand it's, it's, a, it's an even more elaborate thing than a confirmation. So he's dedicated as a child uh, and then when he gets to around about the age of 13 there's this public ceremony where he's declared a man. He makes his commitment to God. And yet as we shall see, Jesus demands to be baptised. Why? Why would he demand to be baptised? He's got faith. He's walked with God from day dot. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. Why would he demand to be baptised? Before we get there, let's look at some scriptures that explain what baptism is all about. If you've got your sermon insert with me, please follow with me in your outline. If someone comes to you and says, I want you to baptise me, you can baptise them. Any Christian can baptise somebody. But there are two biblical requirements for baptism. Two things that are essential before you baptise them, water and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 talks about one of them. On that day about 3,000 believed his message and were baptised. And you cannot baptise someone unless they believe who Jesus is. You can't baptise someone that doesn't know that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. That he's God the Son. That he came and he died in our places. They've got to get the message. And you can't rush it. You shouldn't push it. You shouldn't try and make them make a decision for Jesus. No, you shouldn't. They've got to get faith. Some faith. A little bit of faith in who Christ is. The second thing, Acts 2.38, talks about repentance. Peter said, turn back to God. Be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven. Sins are being forgiven in the waters of baptism. Notice that. Then you'll be given the Holy Spirit. But here's the key. Prerequisite to baptism, I've got to believe. I've got to turn. So someone comes up to you and says, look, Christian, I want to be a Christian. You should lead them to the Lord right now. Right now. But you need to make sure they understand who Jesus is. You need to explain what sin is and take them through repentance. Then you can baptise in water in the Holy Spirit and let me know that you've done that but they've got to believe. They've got to repent. You don't have those two things and that's just water. And when you pray for the Holy Spirit, nothing much is going to happen. You've got to believe and you've got to repent to be baptised. And so when people talk to me about infant baptism, and I understand the history and the traditions and the reasons why that came about, muddled theology but good motivation. I said, can a child believe? Can a child repent and say they're sorry for this? I don't think so. I do believe, however, a very young child can. I really do. It's not about wait till they become teenagers or some stage. At a very young age, a child can know Jesus and start moving in the miraculous. To have a real relationship with Christ. And we want to ask for that and support it and not stand in the way. But two prerequisites, believe and repent. Point number two in your outline. Baptism can only be by full immersion. There's no example in scripture of water being placed on someone's head or sprinkled on them. Uh, well, Juliet and I have just been on an amazing holiday and we've seen baptistries in ancient buildings in Europe and they had these giant bowls and some of the baptistries are just about as big as the church and they would baptise everyone in these little bowls or I guess sprinkling with water before they were allowed to go into church and be considered Christian which is kind of theologically correct but a bit weird that it should just be a sprinkling of water nowhere in the Bible is anyone Christian nowhere in the Bible is anyone ever sprinkled with water they had to die to sin and be buried be raised again two scriptures that illustrate that Acts chapter 8 verse 38 then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water Matthew 16, verse, uh, 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. 
It's always a burial. It's not a celebration, it's a death. It's a burial of a person by full immersion. It doesn't matter what, where the water is, it doesn't matter how warm the water is, it doesn't matter whether it's a sea or your bathtub or a beautiful pool in our church, just it's by full immersion. You go down under the water, you die to self, you be raised up out of the water to live for Jesus. Number three, baptism's part of the salvation package. Now people get really argumentative with me about this and, and that's okay. When I heard David Pawson speak 20 years ago, I got really stressed and upset for months and months and months. And the problem with that picture is everything he says is biblical. So you go back and you check it out. And that's what we must do. And you'll find scriptures that talk about uh, having faith and being saved, lots and lots of them. You'll find scriptures that talk about repentance and salvation, link them together. You'll find scriptures that talk about having the Holy Spirit's a confirmation. You are saved when you know you've got the Holy Spirit, talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there are also scriptures that link salvation with, salva uh, with the water baptism. And in our day and age, we say to someone, oh, look, you pray a prayer today, and when you're ready, you stop sleeping with your partner or whatever it is. And when you're ready, God might speak to you about being water baptized, and maybe somewhere down the track, you'll ask for the Holy Spirit and be filled. Let me tell you something. That never happened in biblical times. When they believed and repented, they were buried under water, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit that very hour. That's what took place in biblical times. And if you want to help people, don't do things according to a tradition or even your experience. Do things according to Scripture. So this is one of four things that links are linked with salvation. Mark 16, verses 16 to 18. Anyone who believes me and is baptised will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe me will be condemned. Anyone who believes me will be able to do wonderful things. By using my name, they will force out demons, and they will speak new languages. They will handle snakes and drink poison and not be hurt. They will also heal sick people by placing their hands on them. So lots of scriptures talk about faith, salvation, repentance, salvation, Holy Spirit, salvation, but there's also scriptures that talk about baptism, salvation. We've compartmentalised things. And as Jeremy was saying yesterday, we've tried to make becoming as Christian as easy as possible rather than as complete and as helpful as possible, the process. It's a big difference. Scripture links the four together. Number four in your outline. Baptism supernaturally cleanses a person. As I've thought about that, because there's so many scriptures that talk about being cleaned through the waters of baptism, I thought, well, which sins? And my conclusion is, I know if I confess my sin and I turn from it, he's faithful and just, it's gone. So my assumption is that the things I can't remember the things I've never confessed, the things I, I said to my parents when I was six or seven, or the, I don't know, some grumpy outbursts at school when I was ten, and all those things, probably thousands of things, I have no recollection of. They still stick like pollution. They've still got to go. And the waters of baptism do that. It's not a symbol. There's something supernatural taking place in baptism that cleanses a person. Ephesians 5 verse 26, just in the one scripture to illustrate it. He made the church holy by the power of his word. And he's doing that every day, isn't he? The more you read your word, the more you do devotions, the more you listen to podcasts and sermons, your brain's changing. Your thinking's lining up. It's being made holy. He made the church holy by the power of his word and he made it pure by washing it with water. Clearly talking about baptism. Number five in your outline, it breaks the control of sin in our lives. I do not like Christians saying, I'm just like you non-Christian, I'm just forgiven. What a load of nonsense. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And scripture clearly says that when you're baptised, the power of sin is broken. And that means, yes, you could still choose to be dumb in sin, but you don't have to sin. It's broken. And I've seen that Hundreds and hundreds of times people come with addictions. People with issues they've been wrestling with for ages and they just can't change. They get baptised and it's gone. Let me read you Romans 6 verses 5 to 7. If we shared in Jesus' death by being baptised, we will be raised to life with him. We know that the persons we used to be were nailed to the cross with Jesus. This was done so that our sinful bodies would no longer be the slaves of sin. We know that sin doesn't have power over dead people. What does that mean? That means if I go to any pool of water, this little pool or a stream or a bathtub, and I say, Russell needs to die. And he wants Jesus to live in him. And someone buries me under that water, and I've already believed. 
moments ago, seconds ago, and I've already turned from my sin, then that becomes supernatural. And I don't have to sin ever again. I'm not like a non-Christian. I'm not. I'm free, I'm chosen, I have the Holy Spirit, I have destiny, I have eternity in my heart. I'm not like a non-Christian. I don't have to do anything bad again. I might be dumb and do it. I've still got freedom, but I don't have to. I'm a free man because I've gone through the waters of baptism. The power of sin over my life has been broken. Number six, baptism is when you get the team jersey. Just one passage to illustrate it. Galatians 3.27. And when you were baptised, it was as though you had put on Christ in the same way you put on new clothes. Someone said to me, Russell, when is the point where God looks at you and he sees you robed in the righteousness of Christ? I say it's when you come up out of the water. So I understand it. When God looks at me, he doesn't see my past, doesn't see my weakness, my failings. He looks at me and he sees the goodness and the purity of Christ wrapped around me because of grace as you let us learn it. Not because of my doing, but because of grace and I'm changed and I'm roped. And he's looking at me like that from heaven saying, Russell, how am I? Any time? You want to call it who? Come on up, Russ. Come and talk to me. I'm listening. No problems between us, Russell. You're walking by grace. You're walking in forgiveness. You're robed in righteousness. You've got the team jersey on. Galatians 3, 27. Number seven. Repentance, baptism under the, underwater, and baptism in the Holy Spirit always happen immediately in Scripture. It happened immediately. The Apostle Paul's baptism is the only one that took three days. It's the exception. Not so sure about the Samaritans in Acts chapter 7. That's really hard to work out. Paul's the one I'm sure is probably the longest. When we get to the media, Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, you know the story well about the eunuch, and he's going through the desert, and Philip the Evangelist runs a huge distance down, just happens to meet the chariot at the right time. The, the eunuch's in the chariot, and he just happens to be reading from Isaiah, which just happens to be the easiest place to point to Jesus in the whole of the Old Testament. As they're going along, he explains the gospel. In the middle of the desert, just happens to be some water there at just the right time, and the eunuch says, and there's only a, a driver driving the chariot and him and Philip. It's, there's some water. Not, can I pray the prayer now? He's been wrestling with belief for years. This is a godly man. I believe part, one of the people God used to bring about the first revival in world history. He's a seeker after God. He gets it and he says, now bury me. There's some water. Why can't you bury me now? And Philip does. Acts chapter 16, verses 31 to 33. They replied, have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This is also true for everyone who lives in your home. Then Paul and Silas told him and everyone else in the house about the Lord. While it was still night, the jailer took them to a place where they could wash their cuts. Then he and everyone in his home was baptised. Here's a hard man. Here's a man that's probably got a violence problem, probably got a drinking problem, certainly got a, a, a language problem. And, and he gets it and he hears it. And at night, not in church, not six weeks later when he's done a Bible study course, that very night, there's some water. And he and his family, his household, get baptised. I mentioned at the start of the message that there are some topics that if I peel away tradition and just look at what it says, it upsets people. And this might be the case for you. You might be hearing me this morning going, Russell, I'm not sure if I agree. It's okay. You're allowed to disagree with me. I'm not Jesus. I'm just someone who's committed to teaching this as accurately as I possibly can because I'll be judged first. Teachers of the word will be judged first. So I take it real seriously. You're allowed to disagree with me, but go back to Scripture. You know what the Bible does not say? The Bible does not say that babies can be baptised. The Bible does not say that baptism needs to be in front of witnesses. It doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that it's an option or it's symbolic doesn't say that. It doesn't say that uh, anything more than faith and repentance is necessary. It doesn't say you've got to do a Bible study course. It doesn't say you've got to wait six months and when you've started being nice to your mum for six months, you can be baptised. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that at all. You don't have to prove anything, learn anything else other than Jesus is Lord and you've deliberately turned from your sin. My experience is this and so many folk disagree with me. And that's okay. I'm accountable to God and each one of you are too. My experience is this, that if someone hears the voice of God and they believe the gospel and they turn from their sins, the sooner I bury that person and pray for the Holy Spirit, the stronger they're going to be. 
If, if my concern is to encourage us in church and every baptism should be in church on a Sunday for our sake, and half the folk coming forward will be terrified of standing in front of so many people. And it's a real barrier for them. And so for our sake, it's nice to be in church and there's going to be a heap of baptisms next Sunday in church, and that's fine. But for their sake, if my role is to make a disciple, my experience, as soon as they hear the voice of God and believe and repent, then I should do what they did in Scripture. Where's some water? There's some water over there in the desert. There's a stream, that's a creek that's fairly full just over there behind that house. The tide's in at the beach. I should, you should. doesn't have to be the pastor. Take them to some water and bury them. And raise them up to live with Jesus and lay believing hands and then pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you want them to do well, if you want them to get in the pattern of hearing the voice of God and obeying, becoming disciples and do it immediately. Because that's what they did in Scripture. That's what works best. We've all come from different traditions. I, I, I was so upset with David Pawson 20 years ago. It took me months and months to get over it and to keep checking what he was teaching out in the Bible. But I want to tell you, friends, irrespective of tradition or background or your experience or how your baptism was, the more you focus on Scripture, the better it's going to be for your child or that person you're evangelizing, that person you're sharing your faith with. I don't believe you need me or some pastor to baptize someone. Any Christian can, but I do want to know. I want to know that they're being followed up. I want to know that there are people around them, you know, so you've got to tell me, or Bridger or the office or something, so I can ensure the discipleship's taking place. But do it straight away when there's faith and when there's repentance for their sake. Now we get to the question I started with this morning, and I'll close with a response to this. Why was Jesus baptised? <laughs> I mean... He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. He grows up. He lives a sinless life. Does he need any unconfessed and washed away? I don't think so. Is he already on the Father's team? I believe so, even though the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out. The Holy Spirit's about to be poured out at his baptism. He's about to be empowered for ministry. His ministry is about to change to a totally different level. But why would he need to be baptised? If it's linked with salvation, if it's linked with cleansing, if it's linked with putting on the team jersey, why would the Lord? And Jesus amazes me. I love what Lana said. I think about what I love about Jesus. I look at what he does and what I read and I go, that's just, that's just amazing. Really? That bold, that radical, that opposite to the way everybody else does things. Really? Oh, wow. You know, he's fantastic. So why, Jesus, get baptised? You're perfect. You're all that we want to be one day. We want to be transformed. Like, why be baptised? Here's some suggestions for you. If you're following with me in your outline. Some suggestions, some possibilities. Number one, or A in your outline, as an example to us. Every person who comes to faith and repentance in the New Testament is immediately baptised and filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible refers to Jesus as our big brother, as the second Adam as the first of a new type of people. So maybe our Lord and Saviour is saying, well, this is what my sisters and brothers are going to do after me. I'll either way. It's what God's kids do. They get buried. They die to self. I'll either way. Maybe that's the reason, as an example to us. Be in your outline. Maybe it's to be the first to put on the team jersey. The word baptizo means to be completely immersed. It was used by ancient people for dyeing cloth well before it was used in the church. And so if people would take plant products or different soils or stones and grind them up, and they'd take a bit of fabric, and maybe it's purple dye, they'd baptize the garment in the dye. And when it came out, it would identify with the colour of the dye. And in that way, when you and I are baptised, we're identified as Christians in the heavenly realms before God. We're identified as Christians. So maybe it's a way of putting on the team jersey. Jesus is saying, I'm going to be the new example. I'm going to be leading the new team, a new type of people. We put on the team jersey. This is what we do. We get we're baptised. Another suggestion is this, that it was a prophetic act, a prophetic act. Some suggest that Jesus knew he was going to be buried one day. He would die for our sins. He'd be buried in the grave and be raised to life again. And was it that Jesus was saying who didn't need his sins washed away, who didn't need, you know, to, to do the things that you and I need to do as imperfect people? Was Jesus saying 
man, I want to be baptized because that's about dying. And I know why I've come. I've come to die so the people at Central, the people in Whangarei, might know the Father. So I'm going to come. I'm going to be buried under water. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried in the grave because I know I'm going to be raised to life again. I've come for this purpose to die and to be raised and to live, to reconnect people with God. And finally, a fourth suggestion. Why did he get baptised? I, I believe it was an act of worship. An act of worship. I'm convinced that Jesus was baptised even though in principle he had no need to be theologically. Because he wanted to do everything that the Father wanted him to do. I believe it was an over-the-top act of devotion. An act of worship. As he comes up out of the water... He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in Mary's tomb. Now, had the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And when he's baptised in the Holy Spirit, he's now empowered to start ministry. And Jesus said the same thing would happen to us in Acts 1 verse 8. When we are baptised in water and the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come upon us, we will be his witnesses. Jesus chose to be baptised because he loved the Father. And he just wanted to do everything that the Father in heaven wanted him to do. Then a voice from heaven was heard, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Would you stand, church? I never pressure anyone to get baptised. I can't argue people into believing or repenting. That's not my business. My business is to answer questions to support what the Holy Spirit's doing. But I'm going to say this. If you've never been buried and raised again. Something's missing. I wouldn't dare say you're not a Christian. I wouldn't dare say uh, things about your faith, but I would say this, it's not normal. And if Jesus said he had to be baptised, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't you? I don't believe it's about age, about knowledge, about what you've proved in your life, how many scriptures you know. It's about doing all that the Father requires us to do. I was looking at a scripture this morning as I prayed, and it came from Samuel, 1 Samuel. And God's voice to Samuel says this, more than sacrifices and offering, what I really want, Samuel, is people to obey me. And I believe with all my heart, if if I wake up in the morning, I say, God, here I am, use me. He is going to use me. He's going to use you. Discipleship is all about, God, here I am. You give me the word. You tell me what to do. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to, because I love you, Lord. Because I want to fulfill your will. I'm going to obey you. Let me pray for you and pray for me. Father, as we close this service, we recognise that there are some issues in Scripture that people don't agree on. And we love them just the same. And Lord, we recognise that you're the only judge. You know people's hearts. Nobody else does, even though we sometimes say we do. We don't. And Lord, we recognise that you're a gracious God. And the world's pretty confused. Lord, we add to so much to what you said in your word. We had extras on. But Father, the issue today is not what this denomination does or that denomination teaches. It's our walk with you. So Lord, we pray for each other. Whether we've loved you and been baptised a hundred years ago or we're not even quite there yet, we pray for each other. That at Central Baptist Church, we would be a family of people. And say, Lord, most of all today, we want to obey We want to do all that the Father requires, whatever that looks like. Give us the desire, Lord, as Jesus exemplified, to do all that you want us to do, to live a heart, a life of worship, a life of obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.